It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome in to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders, and it is a game weekend, which means on this Friday, Steelers DB, Derek Bell joining the show. How are we feeling, DB? Your mic's muted. So we're off to a great start. What a, what a great start that was. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm doing good. Uh, a little bit under the weather. I think uh, the temperature's oh, dropping. Got my uh, got Blue my game. allergy and some other stuff. Like just all messed up. So if I sound a little raspy, that's why. But uh, no, I'm excited about this game. Should be a good one to break down. Flu game, Derek, on the pod today. And uh, Alan, I'm sure that you definitely want me to bring up the fact that it's your birthday on this podcast. So happy birthday to Alan Saunders. I- I, I I brought it up myself this morning because I just learned that Russell Wilson and I shared. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Nice, know that. nice. Happy um, birthday, man. So, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, no big uh, celebratory plans. Got to got to focus in on the uh, drive to Cincinnati tomorrow. So, <laughs> we're on to Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, there we go. So we're gonna get into that game first thing first. We uh, you know, check some boxes here injury wise. Thought we might get some bodies back in this one that it doesn't sound like we're going to. Uh, Monty Adams and Corey Trice rolled out. Alan, at this point, like, is Corey Trice actually like, is it more of a healthy scratch thing? Like, that helmet might math not be in there to get him back in the lineup because that's certainly what it feels like to me. Like, I don't even know if it's worth continuing to say it's injury related, the reason he's not in the lineup. Corey Trice is healthy, man. Uh, and so is Mont. Uh, now, Mont, you could say, uh, be a little bit more being a little bit more cautious. He only had the three practices since he came back from the knee. And he had, you know, like tried to play through it once already and then, you know, only played one snap against the Jets. That's so right. I, yeah. I get the I get the caution uh, with Mont. Corey Trice is healthy. They just are basically telling us that he ain't going to play even when he is healthy. And so they're not going to make a move to get him off the injured reserve and cut someone before they have to. And they don't have to until next Thursday. So that's the way things stand right now. Yeah, so what's going to happen next Thursday? Like, what, what is going to – I mean, we, I guess, kind of just been waiting. Like, these things, unfortunately, typically have a way of figuring themselves out where, like, somebody else will go down or something like that, and it makes it easier. Like, a decision doesn't have to be made. But say nobody else gets hurt. Like, how do you see this playing out next Thursday? Oh, one of the guys that's been a routinely healthy scratch gets cut, probably like Jonathan Ward, who's been through waivers twice already this year. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't see a path to playing time without other injuries or uh, maybe a guy like Max Sharping, who I think, you know, mm. they kind of were scrambling for depth at one point, but does not seem like they're scrambling anymore on the offensive line. Uh, those are two guys that I think, you know, they would probably feel okay about cutting if they had to. Uh, but, you know, I don't think they're going to make a move until they have to. Like you said, go out here against Cincinnati. By the way, Cincinnati has, like, I guess it got new turf this year. Uh, but, like, still, I mean, tell me you're playing on turf when it's that cold. Uh, that's just brutal on the bodies. And so uh, I would not anticipate coming out of this game without any injuries. And then you just got to see whether they're the kind that ends up with people on the IR or not. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in the case of Alex Highsmith, listed as doubtful for this one, uh, was hopeful to get him back, but assuming that he ends up being rolled out officially at some point, uh, will be a heavy dose again of Nick Herbig and Preston Smith opposite of TJ Watt. Yeah, I kind of get the sense that Highsmith could probably play if he had to, but would likely be like in a limited role. And I guess the doubtful is about more like the team deciding they don't want to do that than his like I think he could play it just would definitely be less than 100 percent and I mean I don't know that that sounds smart when you're talking about a player that important uh that awesome stat we got earlier this week still six to know when Alex Asma dresses obviously there's a lot that goes into that but I don't think his presence can be understated so yeah uh seems like one more week for Alex Derek anything to add on the injury front with those guys no, I mean, I've uh, been pretty impressed by what we've seen from Nick Kerbick from a pass rush standpoint, just in relief. I mean, he's leading the team right now in terms of, like, pressure rate. Um, there's definitely been a lot of good, more good than bad. Um, it's just really a matter of, like, you would love to get, you know, all the cards back on in the deck. You know what I'm saying? Like, having that rotation mm-hmm. – 
to where really offensive tackles don't ever really get a break uh, between, you know, being able to shuffle uh, really the big three uh, and then a little bit of Preston Smith in there as well, especially against a Bengals offensive line, you know, really necessary in my opinion to get pressure on Joe Burrow, who's playing probably the best ball of his career, I think. Yeah, especially I wanted to bring up how, you know, when you do get Highsmith back in the fold, was hopeful it would come in this one because a big talking point coming out of that game against Cleveland, uh, one thing that we saw, you know, we see Miles Garrett move around a little bit more than we see TJ Watt move around. And a big talking point out of that game was just that. And could this team uh, move TJ Watt around more? Now, they could do it even without having all these guys at their disposal. But certainly if you had – Herbig and Highsmith at your disposal and Preston Smith along with TJ Watt you can maybe rush him you know from different spots have rush him over the center and do some different things with him uh that you could yeah you can't do when you don't have a guy like that at your disposal now it's Highsmith so you know I'm not saying for sure that they'll do things like that but I'm curious to see if they are able to get a bit more creative whenever it is that Alex Highsmith does get back in the fold I think I think my my big take, and I, I don't know, like, I think other people definitely feel differently just based on, like, the replies that I get to, like, my content and just on social media in general. I don't think they need to move Watt around a lot. I, I don't I don't think he wants to be moved around, and I think that's a reason why they don't do it. Um, I also, like, just – I mean, it's a really small sample size because, like, they just never really, done, like, do it. They haven't done it in recent years. So we really don't know, like, if he's actually, like, I, I'm not convinced, like, he's actually a better rusher, like, when he is doing those things. I think some rushers are better, like, when they get to the chance to, like, work over guards and things like that. But the way that TJ has won just in recent years doesn't really, like, coincide with, like, him lining up in the A-gap like some of these other star pass rushers get the chance to do. Um, I actually, like, my hot take is, like, I would like to see Herbig in that role. And I know, like, it kind of yeah, seems no. counterintuitive because, like, he's kind of small and, like, the arm length and stuff like that. But I just think that if you can manufacture some ways to get some one-on-ones on the interior, assuming that, you know, teams are going to continue to chip the edge rushers, especially in third and long where they're seeing a lot of double chip type of formations, um, if you can manufacture some one-on-ones against him and a guard, I don't really know of, like, very many guards in the NFL that are, like, as quick laterally as he is. Um, and he is like a little bit more of a varied rusher than really the other two guys that they got. So I would actually really like if everything's, you know, all put together and everybody's healthy, I'd like to see Herbig uh, in that role more than anything else and keep TJ on the outside. They could certainly do things to help him. But I also think that TJ, and this is something I wrote about for Steelers now, but like I think TJ can kind of help TJ a little bit as well, like not being as predictable of a pass rusher, which is kind of crazy to say considering how st- statistically dominant he's been just over the course of his career, really. But like the way that teams are kind of sitting on like his outside moves and taking away uh, what he really likes to do with like some of the chips and things like that. TJ can be a little bit less predictable because even in like when he was getting one on one chances against the Browns, he wasn't really winning. Like Conklin was really sitting on his outside shoulder. So um, that's kind of my like, long winded kind of take on what they should do with the pass rushers. Yeah, I'm with you on not moving TJ. I think when you look at like what makes TJ so good and that he's like a guy that has always performed better than like his sort of raw athletic profile suggests he should. And I think a lot of that goes into his insane level of like film study and preparation where he like really breaks down tendencies of guys, both in terms of the tackles that he's facing, the snap counts in the center and the quarterbacks themselves about like when they're going to throw the ball, like their kind of body language tells and things like that. And like, if you move TJ off that right side, you take away like, his insane ability to get interceptions from the line of scrimmage that we've literally never seen anyone else do before like he does. And uh, and I think some of that study that he does kind of g- goes away if you're moving them all over the line. I like TJ where he's at. And I actually think, as uh, was saying about having Heisman back, I think they'll be more inclined to move him around without those guys. I think with Highsmith, I think the Steelers should feel like if you're going to put two guys on TJ Watt, we're just going to let 56 obliterate your your other guy one-on-one, and that is a fine trade for us yeah. to make. Uh, yeah. and, and we've seen them be comfortable with that over the years. Without outside, I think they – but I'm totally with DB. I want to see them get the three outside linebackers out there, and I want Nick Herbert walked up on the center. I want to see some six-man lines and let him mug that A-gap and then – you don't know if you're going to drop because he's so you can drop him into coverage and not feel 
at all bad about it. Like he's so versatile in that way. I would love to see them be more creative in that way. I look at some of the things that Brian Flores is doing right now in Minnesota. I'm like, the Steelers have the personnel to do that, and they just aren't, and I don't really know why. Yeah, just yeah, people just like throw last... that out there. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Smitty. Uh, just like the the last thing I want to say about that is like, you know, Herbig really had a pretty expensive, um, you know, coverage menu coming out of Wisconsin. I don't think that his coverage drops this year have been fantastic when he's been asked to do it personally. And it's been a little bit surprising to me, but it's been a really small sample size. But kind of like what Alan said, I think that the there is more um, variety that they can tap into on passing downs, especially as they continue to stop the run on early downs can get in those third and long situations because you do have inside linebackers that can blitz, can pick. I would like to see Herbig like walked up over some interior guys, especially if they're gonna if they're gonna elect that that's where they want to put the one on ones. Like I would like to see Herbig in there just because I think that his move set is more intuitive and like more like more coincides with like that kind of role on passing down situations. Um, now that doesn't mean like necessarily they they can't move wide around. Like I said, I think he can help himself out with a little bit more varied move set. I also think they could run like more picks and stunts than they probably do. They could blitz a little bit more than they've been willing to do. There's all those different things that they can do. It's just to me, I think a lot of people and I've been guilty of this in recent and like past years too. Like two years ago, I, I remember even like when he was, I think it, that was maybe the year he was banged up. I was like, Hey, like, why don't we move him around? Like all these other pass rushers are getting to do it. Why does it TJ? And like, really it just comes down to me. Like at this point, TJ is not a stupid dude. Like he sees all these other, all these other pass rushers around the league having success with this. I think if it's something that he wanted to do, I think the Steelers would have just done it by now. So, I mean, like it, it really is that yeah. simple to me. It's like mm-hmm. I I highly doubt and would be surprised if it was something that he wanted to do where they were like, no, nah, we're not going to move you around. I just don't think that that's the case. And I don't think that there's enough film in the very rare chances that he's been asked to do it. I don't think the film is, has been enough to really say, like, for sure that it's a good idea. Yeah, people have thrown out the idea of that right just as like a potential solution but 100 percent, what we know would be a potential solution is just other guys winning right you know if you have two or three guys giving attention to tj watt but you have guys on the interior the other side winning it's not going to matter that they're shutting down tj watt because everybody else is going to be generating that pressure anyway so uh that's what it comes down to for me 100 percent on board with you guys i would love to see them use herbig in the capacity that you're talking about when you do have all those guys at their disposal uh i guess on a good injury front here keanu benton and kz good to go some you know bumps along the road this past week we weren't sure 100 about their availability but they'll be good to go keanu benton a player we could talk about you know in terms of the ability to generate interior pressure we need to see an uptick there derek i know keanu benton's one of your guys what have you seen this year would you say that he's you know where you expected him to be or you think there's still more in the tank that we haven't seen yet honestly man like I've been a little bit disappointed, but I think I really don't have anyone else to blame other than myself. I think I set some unrealistic (laughs) expectations for Benton coming into the season because I do think he's a pretty solid player. I just thought that the flashes last season were so high. I I really like his best reps had me thinking that we were going to see like this significant jump and we just haven't really seen it. Now you look at like some of the advanced metrics and stuff. You look at like his win rate stuff. You just look at the film, like his best reps are really good, but I do think he's like kind of like a predictable pass rusher really doesn't have like a varied move set. Like if his club swim doesn't necessarily work, like he doesn't have any counters that works off of it. Um, And like, I just don't think that there's um, a lot of variance to his game. He still kind of needs to develop uh, another kind of counter punch is what I would say. Now I do think he's a pretty valuable pass rusher on the interior. Just maybe the production hasn't been what I thought it would be personally. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't really expect him to be like, a you know, this really, really good run defender in general, just because of the things that they're asking him to do and where they're asking him to play. I just I don't think he's a nose tackle. I just don't. I think he's a three tech. Um, there are definitely like four or five times a game where he just gets completely detonated off the line of scrimmage. And that's just kind of to be expected. I just don't think that he's that that type of player um, on, in base downs. Now, they have been good defending the run on base down. So I see why they haven't really changed things up. Um, but we'll see what that looks like when they get into the postseason and things like that. They may have to face Buffalo with some of these power run schemes and things like that. But yeah. um, overall, I mean, Benton's had a solid season. It's just not necessarily like what I was necessarily hoping for, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alan, we've talked about Benton, but yeah, anything else to add on that front? 
No, I, I think that's pretty spot on and pretty much what I've been saying that I, I, I think I think the one thing that I, I thought he would be better at was converting pressures into sacks. I know that was something he worked a lot uh, this offseason. We haven't really seen that. And, and I think that probably more than anything else is an area where I thought he could be better last year that I haven't really seen improvement. And I know he's banged up. He had this hip. He had a knee. Uh, and and um, so I don't know how much that's, that's a part of it as well. Right. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe the names we talked about are going to come into play here. DB, I'll start with you for this. What is going to be, and I know, Alan, you touched on uh, at least one player on the Steelers defense side of the football that's going to factor into this game in a big way. But DB, what for you, Steelers defense, Bengals offense, what's going to tell the story here in the way this thing goes? I mean, I, I think that the the story always kind of revolves around the Steelers pass rush, right? Like, I think they've got advantages from a matchup perspective across the board. Now, the Steelers pass rush hasn't been as good as I think a lot of people think it's been this year. Um, they're like 20th in pressure rate. They're ninth in sack rate this season. Those are bad numbers, especially when you uh, kind of factor in, like, how many resources opposing teams kind of dedicate to slowing that down. But I don't think they've been the dominant unit that I think a lot of the mainstream media maybe thinks that they've been this season. They do have the matchups, but I actually want to talk about something else. Like, I think the matchup of the game is actually going to be uh, what they do with T. Higgins. Uh, you know, it's kind of been weird. We haven't really seen Burrow, Higgins, and Chase play very often against the Steelers together. And that's yeah, like right. kind of an underrated storyline, I think, coming into this one. Um, specifically, Higgins has had some monster games against the Steelers. Uh, he's really only played in six of them, uh, actually, five, because one of them he got hurt on like the second drive. Uh, but here are like his some of his like stat lines from those games. Uh, last year had the 80 yard touchdown finishes with 140 and a touchdown. Uh, the year prior, nine for 148. A uh, year prior to that, six for 114. And then his rookie season, seven for 115. So he's played basically five games. He's went over 100 yards and four of them. Uh, so I really think like if we expect Joey Porter to shadow Jamar Chase, who's moving around a little bit more in the slot these days, we'll see what they want to do from a coverage perspective. But just the matchup with him and Dante Jackson is something that could potentially uh, decide the game just because Higgins, like where he wins, kind of him being able to create separation at the break point with his size, the big body, the contested catch ability is kind of Dante Jackson's weakness uh, because he's not really strong at the catch point. Like he's a guy who's just he's he's really thin. So you can kind of move him off his spot. So I think how that matchup plays out could very well, you know, decide the, the game. Alan? I would I would not match Joey Porter with Jamar Chase. I would match Joey Porter with T. Higgins. I'm interested to see what the Steelers are going to do, but mm-hmm. I would I think Porter's game is better suited to defending Higgins, and I think the the rest of the Steelers are better able to handle Chase. And Chase moves around so much more, so it's so much easier if you are going to match one guy to one guy to match Porter to Higgins, who pretty much stays in the same spot. And, like, if they're going to move Chase inside, I I like Jackson going inside a little more than I like Joey going inside. And I would be okay with Cam Sutton covering him on the inside if there's deep help, which there usually is in the middle. And the other thing is I think you could put Joey with Higgins and leave him one-on-one and then just give everybody else help with Chase and feel okay about that. I'm interested to see what they do. I don't think that's what they're going to do, but I that's what I would do. I think, too, like it's so different because like you would ideally like to look at like how they played them last year. But Burrow missed both those games. So that's what I'm saying. Like, it's really difficult to (laughs) get like Chase missed one, right? Yeah, it's really difficult to get like schematic tendencies on how the Steelers really want to play this offense. Because like not that a whole lot's changed from a personnel perspective. A lot of the key players are still here on both sides of the ball. It's just the Bengals haven't had these guys in a, in a lot of the matchups. So it's really difficult, you know, whether it's been chased out burrow, you know, Higgins is always a guy that misses a decent amount of time. So um, we'll see what it looks like. I think, you know, that it does create a unique challenge. You mentioned like moving chase around chase has played almost 35% of his snaps on the slot this season. I, one of the things I've been meaning to look up all week and I just haven't got around to it. I swear on everything, just what my eyes tell me, Every time he's in the slot as like the number two or number three to like the trip side, he gets the ball. I don't know. I, it's just an eye test thing for me that I want confirmed via stats. But like any time he moves inside, they're trying to get him the ball. And I think that's really like him moving inside and running a more varied route tree, even that he's ran in the past, I think has really opened things up for Burrow. He's he's throwing to the middle of the field more this season. Um, it's, it's not as predictable outside the numbers, just kind of hero ball, iso ball type stuff. 
Um, so it is a different, it does, this offense does feel a little bit different um, than years past because of uh, how Burrow's playing and like these guys actually being healthy coming into the match. Yeah, I think losing Tyler Boyd made them kind of reevaluate how they want and, and like getting as their, I guess, quote unquote, wide receiver three, Jermaine Burton, who's mostly played outside. I think like that gave them the kind of options where it's like they can play Higgins and Chase and Yoshivas inside, or if they want to play Burrow, they can, or um, Burton, they can move Chase inside. Mm. Like this was the most static offense in the NFL for like the last five years, where like you could turn on any snap of any Cincinnati Bengals game, and I would bet you a thousand dollars I knew exactly where every player was lined up. And now they they're different. They're not like that anymore. Alan, you talked quite a bit on today's morning rush about Minka Fitzpatrick. Uh, what role will he have in this one? We've talked about how they move Jamar Chase around. You got to keep a lid, obviously, on this offense. Um, even if you don't have the splash, is that what can be expected in this one? I mean, I assume he's going to play a whole lot of center field. I, I, I'm curious to see what else they do in terms of trying to give help to those corners because, I mean, even in cover three, Bale – like that's like scary to leave guys on islands with those guys. I like, I don't know. This feels a game like a game where I I don't like the way the Steelers usually line up um, against the Cincinnati offense. So I'm curious to see if they're just going to keep doing what they're doing, or if they have something different in store. But I think Mika Fitzpatrick. I like if you if you've been looking at Mika Fitzpatrick's game and saying like, oh well, they just did stay away from him and splash plays will come like. This is the game where they'll come because the Bengals have no other way to move the ball down the field. And Burrow has a whole lot of like, screw you, I'm throwing it anyway in him. So, like, I, I do think that, like, if you've been waiting for a Mika Fitzpatrick breakout game, this certainly has some elements of it where it could happen. Yeah, pick six against them uh, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. what, like a second play from scrimmage or something like that to kick off the 2022 season. For me, when I look at the Steelers defense, I'm just I'm so interested to see the new pieces that weren't here in the past because we've talked about this where I feel like the Steelers were set up to they've been able to defend the Ravens. They've been able to defend the Browns when healthy. They've struggled the most with the Bengals in terms of their offense within the division. The addition of Patrick Queen, Peyton Wilson, Beanie Bishop, like guys that are this will be their first time within this defense playing against Cincinnati, Dante Jackson, Deshaun Elliott. I'm curious to see how those pieces change the way that this team is able to defend the Cincinnati offense that I think has given them a lot of trouble when they have had that trio healthy. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. I mean, there there's is some new additions and like the the thing with Queen too is like you know you just look at some of the numbers from like some of the more mobile guys. I don't I know people don't really associate. Um, let's just say like they don't associate. Burrow is like a, a runner necessarily, but he is like a really effective scrambler. Um, he's scrambled this year already like 16 times, uh, but the Steelers have been great like uh, on those out of structure plays. They do a pretty good job uh, with their pass rush lanes in terms of keeping guys in the pocket. What makes, um, you know, Queen so unique is like his ability to kind of track down some of those check downs too. And like, that's one of the areas that Burrow's really improved in terms of like not holding the ball as much. He's been better about navigating pressure in the pocket, checking it down. But having a guy like Queen, like having that much uh, range at the second level really helps you with that. One of the things I will say is like this, the predictability of the Steelers defense, they're kind of a set it, forget it type of defense. So we really know, like Alan mentioned, kind of with the Bengals offense being a little bit like that as well. You know what you're going to get on a on a week to week basis for the most part. Um, Burrow this season, like if you just like look at like his numbers against uh, cover three, which is by far like the Steelers most like predominant coverage. Um, mm -hmm. Numbers have been really, really good. He's completing 72 percent of his passes for almost nine yards per attempt. He's got three touchdowns, no interceptions. So um, they, they've done pretty good. I, I'm just interested to see like I, I do think that the Steelers will probably play like stick to their single high kind of. Um, formula. I'm interested to see like how they do out there on the boundary. Um, Porter, you know, how, if the pass rush can, you know, really dictate the terms of this game and make sure that he's not comfortable enough to fire those deep shots uh, down the field. Do you think uh, just some gamesmanship from Joe Burrow talking about not feeling all that comfortable with that with that wrist throwing in the cold, or is that something to watch? There's some numbers there I, I, that he has not played very well in the cold. I don't know if that's gamesmanship or not, but I mean, I don't think anybody on the offense wants to play in bad weather, whether that's temperature, wet balls, precipitation. Mm -hmm. I mean, bad weather always favors the defense. 
Yeah. I guess while well, I'm speaking, because I know like the risk thing, right? That everybody's kind of just been watching this entire year, seeing how he's going to react. And, you know, when he's taking care of it on the sideline, people reacting to, uh, and yeah, he was asked about it and just how he's dealing with the cold. And he just said, I wasn't pleased with my performance today. Like the first practice that they had uh, in cold weather since that. So I don't know, I, I, something to watch, I guess, but I didn't know if it was just, you, you felt like it was gamesmanship on his part, just saying something there. Go ahead, DB. I will say that, like just in like watching Burrow and like seeing yeah. how he typically uh, reacts, like in those press conferences, Burrow is a guy that very rarely seems happy about anything he does. I think he's very much like a perfectionist. Like they've had some games this season, which you'd expect. Like you don't want your quarterback going up there. Like when your when your team's whatever their record is, that they haven't won a lot of games this year. He's played very well, but the team has lost a lot of games in which he's played very well. But like every week, it seems like he goes to the press conference and looks like he's like just lost his best friend. Like he's just so so <laughs> mad. Even if like he just threw like five touchdowns, like he's like furious. And even even that's even that's been true. the case in the games that they have won. So I just kind of wonder if it's like one of those things where it's like yeah. he just maybe he feels a little bit of the pressure too with the Cincinnati defense knowing like how porous they've been really although they have been better over the last month um you know how porous they've been for the majority of the season maybe he just feels pressure like okay I've got to be perfect like we've got to put up just an unbelievable amount of points for us for me to keep this team competitive I would really enjoy it though if he went up there and was just like yeah I'm an MVP candidate if my defense didn't suck yeah everyone else is garbage <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about from the Steelers offense going against that. I like that word that you used, porous. I know they've been better over the last month, but we're still going to use that word just because I really enjoyed it. The porous Cincinnati Bengals defense of the 2024 season. Uh, Alan, we'll start with you for this one. What is the key matchup here for the Steelers offense against the Bengals defense? I think the uh, the young interior offensive linemen need to get right. They, they probably had their worst game of the season against the Browns. This is a Bengals team that you can run the ball on. Their weakness is definitely interior defensive line. Um, their linebackers are good. I don't think it's a game where you should expect to see, like, Najee Harris, like, dribbling guys like basketballs all the way down the field or anything like that. But I think the Steelers can run the ball up the middle and stay on schedule, and that uh, we'll let them get into areas where they can be unpredictable, especially if they get to like second and short, third and one, in like good areas of the field where you might go for it on fourth down anyway, and then you can really unlead, un unload on some deep balls. The, the secondary has been straight up bad at times. I don't know that the Steelers want to get into a game where they have to throw a bunch of deep balls, but I'll say like the ace in the hole sort of is that like if this game goes poorly for the Steelers and does not go to plan, you can come back on these Bengals all day long because they just cannot cover the deep pass. And the so one thing the Steelers have been consistently pretty good at. Derek, do you think it's – we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier this week. Um, do you think it's more of a, a personnel thing, like with the safeties that they've lost over the last couple of years? Is it communication on the back end? I know they don't they, – DJ Turner is hurt right now as well, which certainly wouldn't help things. But even at the beginning of the year, they weren't good before his injury and stuff. So what do you mm -hmm. think is the cause for the regression with the Bengals' defense? To me, I – it's it's almost it's difficult to really put a put a pin to it. I just think that the they've made some miscalculations from a personnel perspective, like in terms of like getting scheme fits um, for their defense. I just think that they massively understated like how good Jesse Bates was. Nah, I think that really is what it comes down to. Every decision they've made to kind of right that wrong since then just has not paid out for them. Um, like I mentioned earlier this season, like there's been times where, you know, their safeties have been really shaky, especially like fitting the run from depth. Um, I personally think you look at Von Bell on tape and like early in the season, um, especially like, and you could just tell, like, he's not the same player that he was like two, three years ago, where I think he was a real stabilizing force for them. Um, you mentioned like, just like the, uh, the volatility of their corners, um, you know, I think Cam Taylor Britt has been one of the more like up and down guys. I think a lot of people were really excited about what his rookie season last year looked yeah. like. Um, and that just has not, you know, translated. Um, and I think that really, you know, you can you can definitely get some throws on the boundary, the deep balls, things like that, that really the most consistent part of um, the Steelers passing offense. But I will also say, too, like in terms of 
trying to get some of the red zone woes under control. The Stewards have been abysmal uh, this year in the red zone, particularly they've gotten worse uh, when Russ has been at quarterback. Uh, but the Bengals have given up seven touchdowns to tight ends this season. Pat Farmuth also had a huge game last year. If you think back to like the game after Matt Canada was fired, um, just in terms of like attacking that too high shell, they were able to get him on some vendors, some things over the middle to attack that spot of the defense. So who knows? Maybe, maybe this is a this is a Farmuth game as well. Yeah, on the too high thing, I mean, it's sort of always been the defense that you want to play against Russell Wilson. It's the defense the Bengals want to play anyway. I would be surprised if we see, like, anything else from Cincinnati in this game. Like, I think it's just going to be all, all, all cover two or some kind of variant. Yeah, George Pickens obviously had a massive game against Cincinnati last year, mm -hmm. uh, right before Christmas, and uh, we're you know the George Pickens cycle. So now we had last week, obviously the altercation. He had his little thing with the media today, which means he's going to have a massive game on Sunday, and we're just going to do it all over again a couple times before the season ends. So that's my call out on offense: is George Pickens is going to have a big day. I will say I, I'm kind of uh, interested, like the too high thing. The Browns actually broke tendency a little bit last week, um, played some too high. I actually thought that uh, Russ made some great throws when they went into those looks. Um, he missed a – it was funny. He missed Calvin Austin on a little bender in yes. the first half, and they actually ended up coming back to a really similar play because the way that uh, – what the Browns were doing is they, they like to get into a lot of like – NTTs and but they were running some cover six stuff last week as well and they were they were basically clouding the single receiver side whenever the Steelers would go like you know trips or run their three three wide receiver sets out there uh, but they were playing quarters uh, to the opposite side and the Steelers had a really good tendency breaker on the second half ended up in a touchdown by Calvin Austin it was a really nice throw a really nice catch from Calvin too um, but yeah I just I kind of can I, I don't know I think that eventually like you know teams are kind of going to realize that. They shouldn't press George. Like that's the one thing that I think the Browns did a good job of last week. And I don't, I know there it's a small sample size of one game, but if it was me and I was a defensive coordinator, I wouldn't press George really ever. I don't think, unless I was playing like some type of cloud coverage to his direction, because anytime he gets pressed, it's like an auto alert for Russ that he's gonna okay, I'm I'm checking to the fade, we're gonna throw a go ball. And like George like has gotten really good. Um, at like knowing like how he can get away with some of these push offs on the boundary too. So like he's just so good at that at that area. I would personally play him more like off coverage, seven, eight yards or anything like that, because the Steelers have not really thrown like a lot of hitches, a lot of smokes, uh, short passes out to the boundary. So it's like, why are you gonna give him that type of access throw? Like force them to throw the ball underneath to him and like see if George can remain engaged over the course of four quarters. That's what I would personally do. Now, I don't know. People don't ask me what to do about defending George Pickens, but I just, I wouldn't press him. Like I just think he's demolished that all season long and it really fits well with what Russ can do. But the Cincy corners, they've been very uh, scattershot all season long. There's going to be plays to be made down the field. A bender to Calvin Austin. That's a different type of bender than the one that I'm familiar with, I think, but <laughs> Uh, all right, let's get into some predictions, of course, before we get out of here. Hmm, I don't remember who we started with last time because I feel like it's been a couple weeks. We uh, need to start with Alan because I need to get mine together. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes it easy. All right, well, Alan, you got to start us off for predictions then. Uh, okay, uh, my bold prediction is uh, – I don't know that I have a bold prediction for this one. Um, uh, let me think about this. My bold prediction is, uh, you know, you guys have both used the Minka Fitzpatrick interception yeah. as a bold prediction. Yeah. And it has and not I worked. This, I think this is the week that I'm taking the Minka Fitzpatrick interception as the bold if prediction. If it doesn't happen, we can't do it again. We can't go back. All right, well all right. I'll check the list. final box. Uh, right. My prediction for this game is that uh, the Steelers are going to get a lot of things right that they've been getting wrong on offense. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're going to score a lot more. Uh, but I think the version of the Cincinnati Bengals offense that has been looming uh, is going to arrive, and this is going to be a shootout that the Steelers can't keep up in. Cincinnati, 31-27. Dangerously close to the number I have in my head right now. Dangerously yeah. close. Uh, all right. Um, here's where I'm thinking. So – 
a lot has been made over like Miles Garrett's comments. You know, TJ's been asked mm-hmm. about it. He's definitely aware. Like a lot of professional athletes are way more online than I think fans really realize. Um, he's aware of like the stuff that's been said. I think about him, about Garrett, about like who the best pass rusher is. You know, since that game on Thursday night, um, to which you know they get the better of the Steelers for sure in that regard. Garrett got the better of what? Um, I think that TJ has a huge game. Uh, on Sunday. I just think that he's going to be really ready to go, really locked in. The, the Bengals, it's a really like pure like drop back team. Burrow does a good job, like has done a better job this year about like not taking sacks, been better about like mitigating sacks. But I, my, my bold prediction is that TJ has his best game of the season. Um, I'm not going to sp- specifically say that it's going to be like sack related, um, but I will say like it, just a combination of everything with like pressures, quarterback hits, sacks, and also like we've seen him make some really nice plays on Burrow in terms of getting his hands in the passing lane uh, with all those quick throws, like slants over the middle, things like that. So I'll just say that TJ has his best game of the season um, this year and kind of like, you know, is is really motivated. I actually think he's going to have – I know he's got the matchup next week circled as well. So that's my bold prediction. I really went back and forth on this one about like whether I wanted to pick the Steelers to win or not. I do kind of agree with Alan that I think this is going to be a pretty high scoring game. Um, I'm going to say that the Steelers win, but they don't cover. I will say it is 28, 27. Aren't they, aren't they underdogs? They're, they're dogs. Are they really? Yeah. Yeah. They're wow. two and a half point dogs. Oh, okay. Well, I guess this makes sense. And I'm going to take them 28, 27. Um, so I okay. guess they do cover. Um, <laughs> I thought they were two and a half point favorites. That's my bad. Um, wow. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, yeah. 28, 27 for me. I'll say Boz with the late game winning field goal. Mm-hmm. Okay. My bold prediction is going to be very in depth. I'm, I'm going to set, I'm going to literally set a stage here for you for the way this is going to happen. On You're predicting a Van Jefferson touchdown. No, I'm not. I'm not oh, doing it again. Oh, I like that too. I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, I'm uh, predicting... Alan, I, you can get it great odds on FanDuel if you're really, really <laughs> feeling froggy. I mean, the yard, yeah, the even van, the yardage taking, prop. I'll say this. I'll take the Van Jefferson yardage prop over this week. Okay. okay. Um, George Pickens is going to have two touchdowns on Sunday. On one of those touchdowns, it's going to be some defensive breakdown where somehow Mike Hilton ends up being the closest defender to George Pickens. George Pickens is going to hand the ball to Mike Hilton and it starts a small altercation. Is he going to give right. him the too small, the the too small? Yeah. Or the... Some, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Someone yeah. send that to George. The little, sure little hand down <laughs> kind of thing. Um, I am very worried about the way that this matchup lines up on paper. Um, I think the Bengals passing attack is obviously as good as it gets in the lead when they have all three guys rolling right now, they have all three guys rolling and I like the complimentary pieces that they have. You mentioned Chase Brown as a back. I think Mike Kosicki is a talented tight end. Uh, and I, I like Andre Yoshivas. Um, I don't know that how much Jermaine Burton's going to play in this one or if he's going to be at a local casino or what's going on with him. Um, but I do like some of the complimentary pieces that they have on that Cincinnati offense as well. So uh, I got the Bengals in this one, unfortunately, 33 oh to 28. Y'all are making me oh, ride by myself yeah, in a game close. that I'm not really all that comfortable on. That's that's tough. That's tough. Uh, listen, the people – what ha- last time – or not last time. There was one where you – I think you went opposite of us and you were the one that was right. Okay, uh, I d- I do want to just bring up one more thing. I, I uh, because I was scrolling at this, just like we were talking about, just the impact of T Higgins and things like that. Yeah, um, Burrow has been great this year, regardless, uh, with or without Higgins, uh, when he's been off the field. But uh, with T Higgins on the field this year, Burrow's completing sixty nine percent of his passes. Um, he's got fifteen touchdowns to two interceptions. He is averaging. <laughs> 0.36 EPA per play to give you guys mm. kind of a uh, just a, a good reference point on like what 0.36 EPA per play would be. Lamar Jackson is the MVP favorite right now over the course of the season. Lamar is at 0.28 EPA per play. So he is like significantly been better than Lamar Jackson with T yeah. Higgins on the field. So, um, you know, me bringing that up and picking the Steelers about 30 <laughs> seconds ago probably isn't going to age well in the receipts department. Um, but I just that that's kind of the impact of like what you're saying, Smitty, in terms of like how difficult it is to defend like two legitimate number one wide receivers. Yeah, that made me feel even worse. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
Uh, if your prediction comes right and they win 28 27, even though they gave up 27 points to this team, I would be feeling great about that yeah. defensive performance. Yeah, I mean, th- this is this is going to be a uh, it's going to be a really good game. I, I think it's going to be fantastic. I, I kind of like honestly, like the further in I kind of got into it this week in terms of like watching some Bengals film and stuff. I really wish I was going to the game because it is like a hop, skip, and a jump for me. I, I kind of is true. Yeah, what the heck? Go. Yeah, it's, you know. Hmm. So all right, well, they won't find you in Cincinnati. They yeah. will find Allen there. But DB, tell the people where they can find you. Yep, at Steelers underscore DB on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, you can find all my written work at SteelersNow.com. Uh, like I said, I wrote a little bit of a piece on just the Steelers pass rush, uh, kind of where they're kind of stack right now, where they need to go in order to get, you know reach their full pos- potential. And then I also have something up uh, early in the morning tomorrow just on the Bengals offense and just further hitting on some of the stuff we talked about on the pod. But if you're interested in kind of a further breakdown, you can check that out as well. There we go. And to somebody that will be, in Cincinnati for the Steelers and Bengals. Alan, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me on Interstate 70 for most of the next 48 hours. And, uh, yeah, I'll be uh, in Cincinnati at Ace Saunders underscore PGH on X Instagram, TikTok, and Blue Sky PGH. Steelers Now, sites account SteelersNow.com. Like, subscribe, hit that bell for notifications here on the YouTube channel. Aaron Becker with another episode of Steelers Spotlight tomorrow. With a special guest, uh, we'll leave this one. We'll leave this one surprise. Yeah, we don't need to say who it is. Special guest, go and watch it or listen to it, wherever. Uh, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell here. Hit us in the comments with your predictions, your thoughts, how much you hate Alan and I for picking against the Steelers this upcoming weekend, and how much you love DB not only for his prediction but also just his analysis and everything he does on Twitter and the film rooms and all that stuff. We know it's coming. So just let's get it over with. If you're listening somewhere else, leave us a five-star review and subscribe over there. Apple, Spotify, wherever your podcast from. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive. Same thing on TikTok. Find, find us over there as well. And then you'll find me everywhere. Zachary Smith, PGH. For Alan Saunders, Derek Bell, and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. 